I'm going to ask you if your name is pronounced Andrea Silva. It is. Good. I'm glad. I know how to spell it and I do know how to pronounce it, as it turns out. Um, he, well, we'll start early. I asked him this question and he said, yes, absolutely. I said, so were you a big sci-fi geek as you were growing up, you know, reading sci-fi magazines and books? And he said, oh, absolutely. Um, he's only been in Alaska seven years. He got a master's in spacecraft engineering in England, and he got a PhD in theoretical physics in Texas. Came to Alaska seven years ago. He was on the faculty at UAA, but he's not anymore. He's a co-founder of Icarus Interstellar. Two, 200 people all over the world are working on the idea of accomplishing interstellar flight, physicists, engineers, designers, artists, he'll tell you more about it. So anyway, um, he will present and afterwards answer your questions. So thank you very much and let's just bring him right on. So thank you for being here. This is my first uh, my first science club presentation. I've been a, I've been a spy, you know, coming in in the middle mid lecture over the last you know couple of couple of years, um, and uh, just really great to it's really great to be here. I wanted to, to to sort of take you on a little journey through which I hope to explain um, uh, why you know why why this is interesting, why this should be engaging. So let's let's not start with what a color is. Let's just start with just normalizing our minds for a second, forgetting about what we're uh, what we're about to hear. And just think about what it is, what it is, how people respond to various to various situations. Okay. So we're looking at uh, something. I'm going to have to take this in my hand because it's, I feel like I'm fading in and out. So what do you see in this image? You know, some some person, someone might see. Uh, you know, obviously it's a well, but you may see something that, something that's uh, dark and unexplored. You may think, you know, you're frightened because uh, it's dark in there, and there may be something, something curious and mysterious there. Maybe you're an architect or a structural engineer, and you'll think of, you know, the, the pattern of the, the bricks that made up, you know, this um, this well, or how old this well is. You know, everyone has different reactions to different to different stimuli, to different inputs, and it's a very personal thing. You know, what do you think of when you see an, a wide open ocean? Do you want to swim? Do you want to? Do you wonder how many? What time of day it is because the sun is setting? Like, do you remember your time back in Santorini or something when you when you had a wonderful romantic moment? Or you know, do you think where am I? Am I in the middle of the ocean? Am I all by myself? Am I? Am I on a dock? Like, am I standing on solid ground, or am I in the middle of the ocean? Or am I, you know, all alone, or am I with friends? Like everything, every every situation, every every um, every experience that we have is very subjective. You know, you might ask how far you will go. You know, how far are you willing to go to explore? You know, this empty ocean. Or this empty, or this, uh, uh, or this, this desert. You know, or is it an empty desert? You know, are you what? And what is it that you, that your eyes are focusing on? You know, if uh, if someone said, I showed this to Andreas, and Andreas said I wanted to go there, would you automatically think that I wanted to go to the stars that are shown in the back, or maybe I had a history of wanting to explore, you know, the. the ancient Egyptian ruins and I wanted to, to head into the desert and try to explore something else. Because it looks like there's something awesome in the back there that would make someone might want to see. The point here is is to, to drill down into people's motivations. Okay, to take it away from something of the, the technical scientific, you know, things about exploring space. Now what are the motivations for exploring space? Like how do people think of you know this is the time this is the time to do this we're gonna we're gonna button down and we're gonna go out into space. So there were some people that thought that they should explore space, and they didn't just wait for this to to happen naturally. They didn't say at some point 
uh, a government or someone very rich will have enough technology and they'll be able to go to space and that would be great for us to just watch them do this and be a part of it as a just a human society. No, there were a couple of people that orchestrated the space age. And if you drill down into, into the history of it, it's a really fascinating story. So there's these three guys, Van Allen, Chapman, and, and Berkner, and they all have, were doing research or they were interested in, in exploring space, doing experiments in ionospheric physics, physics, how radio waves reflect off of the atmosphere. But uh, one problem that they had was that they needed access to the entire planet in order to do this. They needed to be able to travel quickly, rapidly. They needed to have the teams deployed around the globe, taking simultaneous data and things like that. But it was very difficult because we were talking about post-war, um, you know, world basically where everyone is a little bit reserved. Everyone, everyone is, is very, very, you know, there's trepidation over just on opening borders. So they said, uh, I know, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna do this trick, okay? And they all got together, the story goes in Van Allen's uh, townhouse somewhere outside of New York. And they said, and the, there were 20 people uh, assembled there. And they said, we've got a plan. And this plan is that we're gonna do this thing called the geophysical year, okay? And just like there was a global polar year where in 1901, where the entire, it was a challenge where the entire human race was, was challenged to explore the poles. And there was no war, there was no conflict with the poles, and all of this research, all of these countries just went merry go around, you know, exploring the poles, and when they saw the turn of the Russians or when they saw the Germans, they didn't think they're gonna, they're gonna you know, there's gonna be trouble up ahead. They just thought, oh, there's another research team. And what did you guys discover? And it was, you guys should come to our conference, and it's going to be great. And they figured that's the kind of thing that we need to explore space. But in order to do it right, we got to like put our own people in the right position. So this guy was into rocketry, and he said, "I'm going to I'm going to become the chief scientist for all the explorer missions, okay, for like launching the actual scientists, the, the actual the experiments." The other guy said, I'm going to become the president of the Special Committee of the International Geophysical Year, which was something that no one was particularly interested in. So when they saw a prominent scientist come in, Sidney Chapman, who actually taught at Fairbanks for, for almost 25 years, they said, oh yeah, sure, Dr. Chapman, please walk into the seat. So he was the person who approved the, the International Geophysical Year. The other person designed the science, and the other person put together the International Council of, of Scientific Unions who promoted the geophysical year. So they all said, the three of us are gonna do this thing. It's all gonna work out really great. And it worked. It worked, it worked brilliantly, but it was a trick. They forced this, they forced the space age to happen. <coughs> and thus the international Physi geophysical year was set for 1957 to 1958. And this is something that's, that's often forgotten because in 1957, something very important happened in space exploration, right? And the most important thing that some people might think of is, is that this Sputnik satellite was launched into space. Actually, the most important thing that happened is that, was that the Van Allen belts were discovered. Why? Because the Van Allen belts is, is a belt of radiation which protects the planet from harmful radiation. So that means that we know what we need to, to protect ourselves against once we get outside of our atmosphere in order to do human spaceflight. It also tells us a bunch of information about how radio waves bounce around the world, and thus we connect it through telecommunications the entire planet. Telecommunications is the most important thing in mankind. Why we're here talking to each other, you know, craving to get on Facebook and to tweet something that happens. Telecommunications, not picking up the phone. That's the most important thing. But people managed, like Chapman managed to get his, his research validated. Um, Berkner and the rest of them you know, went on to do other amazing things. And such a, a, an age of wonders came about. And all these things, other things happened really quickly. Why? Because these three guys just want to remember, everyone to remember that. These three guys had this idea. Okay. Then NASA came together. NASA used to be something like DARPA, then they split it into two because they wanted a more strategic defense uh, mil military aspect to it. So then there was DARPA and NASA. NASA was freed up to do whatever they wanted to do. Managed to land something on the moon. The Apollo missions, 
the Mariner spacecraft explored the entire terrestrial planet, all the inter terrestrial planets. The terrestrial planets are the inner, the planets that are from the Earth inwards, you know? Mars, Mercury, Venus, they went everywhere. One spacecraft. They just changed a couple of things on it. No problem. They said, we'll just put it on a rocket and send it forward. We'll go a little bit deeper in. They had, they had humans in space, the American Skylab, the Mir Space Station, human occupation in space. So what did we learn from all this? You know, there's this big burst of activity. We explored, we explored space. So this is a little history, you know, to get you to put this back into concept. It's a little history of what happened, you know, where, what's going on right now and stuff like that. What did we learn? We learned some pretty cool stuff that there's water on the moon. And if there's water, you have power, you have everything. We learned that Venus is hot because some people thought that it was a paradise. Amazons and stuff like that, <laughs> but it's not, it's a, it's a molten lava hell with sulfuric acid rain. Um, I'm just going to the slides here. I shouldn't have ventured to try to do this. We learned that Mars had water and probably microbial life. There's no doubt in my mind that there is. We found that Europa has oceans, probably enough water uh, to have some kind of life, you know, at some depth underneath underneath the ocean, because life is tenacious, and it's an almost inevitable chemically if there's the correct if there's the correct circumstances. We just have to go and explore and find them. And this is a rendering from the 70s, which they thought, you know, we're going to melt, make a, a nuclear penetrator here that's going to melt through the ice, and then it's going to release a submarine, and they're going to go and explore underneath the moon. I love this image underneath the uh, Europa. I really, really love this image because. The basic idea hasn't changed, that this is, this is how it would be done. We found out that Jupiter has stormy weather. Of course, we knew that stuff from, from, uh, from uh, Voyager's time also. And we found out that Titan has an atmosphere, even storms. So all of this information is, is, is all of it in the last 50 years. It's like a massive rush of information about not just our planet, all of these other planets. We found that Pluto is a dwarf and that the New Horizons mission is almost, uh, is just turned on again. And it's going to be exploring Pluto in detail. And we started discovering some other stuff. Remember that controversy with Pluto? It's not a planet anymore. All this stuff. And we thought, well, there's this other, what a pity, really, you know. Doesn't seem right. That, it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem right. You're right. <laughs> uh, but Pluto is not by itself. Right? So Pluto kind of got cornered off everyone and thought, oh, you're kicking it out of the solar system. It's all by itself. They're uncategorized. There's hundreds of thousands of objects like Pluto. And it's interesting when people start building this family of objects like Pluto that they, that they discovered Ceres. And Ceres is a very small planet in between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. And it's a perfect place to go and explore because it's very small, so the surface gravity is low. You can land on it and take off fairly easily. It's not very cold. It's cold, but it's not as cold as Jupiter. I'm going further out. And there's, and there's an atmosphere there. It's a fascinating place. You know, there needs to be a mission to Ceres, if anything. And there's a lot of objects like it. Look, it's, even its orbit is almost circular. It's, it's a beautiful planet to explore. And here's its comparison with, uh, oops, sorry, the, the series was the object that was lower, lower on there. So we started exploring more and more and more and more and more and more stuff. And we're discovering things about the universe that we were speculating. Things like, that didn't work, right? <laughs> Let me go back. Not yet. I know how to do this. We discovered that there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Uh, of our, yes, at the center of our of our galaxy, right? Which we've always thought that there would be. We also always thought that there should be black holes, but some people denied its existence. Why should there be black holes? It sounds like just a weird, strange, a physical thing to do. It's just too powerful, damn it. <laughs> this kind of thing exists. Well, we found 
This is just images of the center of our galaxy. And we found that these are stars, and they're orbiting around a non-existing object. There's nothing there. That where that star is, there's nothing actually there. So there's a supermassive nothing at the center, at the center of our galaxy that has four billion times the mass of the sun. That is, you can call it something else if you want to. It must be probably black holes. So we verified all of these things, you know, very very recently. These are the, this is all the consequence of three people coming up with a little ploy. We can't get what we want, we're gonna, we're, let's just force this geophysical there, right? It's a trick, it's like three weird people over there on the table, they're plotting the next technical and scientific evolution and era of the human race. Because that's what it comes down to, individuals. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind while we're, while we're talking. But you know, for the rest of us, they, and a bunch of scientists, you know, got all this awesome tech, and we're looking at it, we're thinking, yeah, that's great, way over there, there's a planet. I went home, you know, my bed was a little uncomfortable today, my back hurts, that's kind of what's interesting to me. You got other stuff over there, I'm not a professor, say for instance, I was. For other people, that's not interesting. That's not, that, how does that relate to me? Well, it relates a little bit to everyone, right? Because all this technology brings on a new form of civilization, in a sense. There's new ways of interacting with each other, there's new access to information, there's ways to, there's safety, there's computing, there's things like phones and mobile phones and smartphones and things that are delivering libraries to everyone's hand, to the palm of everyone's hand. But beyond that, there's an artistic motion. Okay? There's a, there's a, there's a, the civilization itself takes on a different direction. It takes all of this information, and the people who are technically minded turn it into technology, and they become programmers, and they become, you know, they become scientists and engineers, and, and so on and so forth. But that's not everyone. That's not everyone. Some people are artistic. Some people sing. Some people draw. Some people dance. You know, those people are inspired differently from our civilization. They're inspired by like artistic movements like this. Like, I want to create this beautiful, postmodern, super scientific, aquatic habitat. You know, why would you want to do this if you hadn't been inspired by the space age? Would you be looking, be, would you be inspired by the Middle Ages and say, this is what I want the future to look like? It's really, really unlikely. Let's see if this is going to work. Architectural movements, you know, like exploring the interaction of people with space. Generally, how do you how do you feel in different spaces? How does space explore? Us? How does open open areas and, and uh, like the unknown and things like that? Explore? How do we feel about that? Like things like this. Clearly, a spaceship, right? Someone who just wants to live on a space station. So, so what's next? You know, this sounds great. Obviously, everyone's convinced, right? Oh, cool. It took me 15 minutes. So what's next? Well, maybe we can send, we can build the replacement to the space station. This is the Venture Star and the X-33 prototype. This is the next generation Hubble Space Telescope, which is called the James Webb Telescope, the Constellation and the Ares rockets that are going to be, we're, we're going to be more powerful than the Saturn V's. Um, you know, asteroid mining and missions and things like that that NASA has planned. Sounds good, right? They're all canceled. They're all canceled. And this is the reality that we live in. You know, this is the reality. Because what we, were, what we were experiencing from this inspiration from these three people was their fantasy that we, that they gave to us. And this is the reality that we live in. That was their generation, this is our generation. This is what we did with the tools that they gave us. Because we built the tools today that our children are gonna use. It's not the other way around. All of this is canceled. So what happened? Why? We need to explore some things. Oh, NASA's budget has been declining. Haven't you heard that? Right? NASA's budget is declined, they don't have money. You've heard that, right? No, it, doesn't, it has not been declining. NASA's budget has not been declining. 
Like, I, you know what, sometimes when I hear stuff like this, I think, as this budget has been, I mean, it's just been declining continuously, and they haven't been firing or closing down any of the, the, the NASA, you know, research centers and things like that. Like, let me just have a look. I mean, this is data from Wikipedia. It's not, it's not secret information, right? It's not been declining. There's about 15 billion, 16 billion a year. If I had 16 billion a year, I think that we could do quite a bit. Especially since you had this big technological bump. In 1958, there was nothing. How did they get it all that time? The time when they were spending the most, they were making the most achievements, the budget wasn't there. Now there is a steady budget for maintaining it. We don't do that though. You know, you look at industries, you know, I went into this in some detail. 26 companies, a lot of diversity in the United States. Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Rockwell, McDonnell, Douglas, Hughes Space. Some of you may remember some of these. All of these slowly get consolidated into bigger and bigger, bigger companies, it's just corporate dynamics. But what happens is, and something very similar happens in Europe. Look, again, 21, almost 20, 22 in the, in the United States and 21 in Europe. It's like almost uncanny. It's like some kind of, some kind of corporate zoology going on there in survival of the fittest, where all around 20 you know, end up being around four at the end. But what happens is that the diversity and the competition that these companies had was driving transformative technological change. That doesn't exist in these four companies, which are incumbent in their own markets. Fascinating. <laughs> it's a fascinating fact to, to, to talk about it at a science pub. Uh, <laughs> talk about market change. It's an awesome time over a beer about market change. But what's the point was that people were, were, were mis miscalculating certain things. They thought that there was continuous flow of technology and that they would incubate these technologies and things like that. But that's not what companies, big companies do. They grab a corner of the market and they try to make the product better. And it rests on past in inventions. Those inventions spawn from the Apollo era. That is that technology that we're using today. There's no transformative change because there's no exploration. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this, this boring stuff. So that's, that's the point here, is that there's a lack of transformative in education and, and technology since Apollo. We used to have a, a, a device called the Saturn V rocket that could live 120 tons to low Earth orbit. The best possible, and 45 tons to, to lunar transfer orbit. 45 tons to lunar transfer orbit. Our best conceivable rocket today, which doesn't actually exist, is the, is, the, is the Falcon Heavy by SpaceX, which doesn't exist yet, mind you. It is projected to be able to lift 53 tons, 21 tons. This is our best possible, within the next 10 to 15 years, rocket that we could have as a, as a civilization. There's a problem here. 50-year-old technology is only now being space proven, so there's no, there's no like, let's just do it, man, let's see what happens. Let's just take a risk, yeah, let's see what happens. What a solar sail, Whoa. 50 years, we've got to debate whether or not we need to do it. The J Japanese are like, what the heck, screw it, man. Let's just send the thing up, like, put a bunch of scientists on it, give them a couple of million a year, and let's do it. Send up the Icarus spacecraft. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. Actually, it stopped, stopped working. They were like, oh, all the, uh, you know, respectfully, you know, to, to, to tell the propaganda and, and, the, and the media, but CNN was like, we told you so. The Japanese tried to do space exploration. What, you know, they need to leave it to, to the United States to sort it out. But although you weren't doing it. Icarus turns around, it had one of the most most efficient artificial intelligence engines that had ever flown on a spacecraft, it repaired itself in flight. It was tumbling, it was slowly charging its batteries whenever it was glancing at the sun, and when it had enough energy, it, it, it opened its solar sails, 
reoriented itself towards the sun all by itself, and 90 days later, sent a, mes a message back and said, sorry I was late, <laughs> but I'm okay now. So let's start working. And it's still flying. It fixed itself. Things like the Vesemir engine, that was like a beautiful te new technology, still not being it was mothballed by NASA, it was picked up by a former astronaut who developed. He wanted to put the money together himself, he left NASA to do it. Still not been proven. Still waiting. Still waiting. Things like advancements in, in human spaceflight is lost. You know, this is a dangerous, it's a dangerous field. It's not like no one is ever going to get hurt. This is like a really difficult thing to, to get across. When you're exploring, you know, when you're getting into a cave, since like 50 people are exploring the deepest cave in the planet, you know, and then they, they come back six months later and they said, we lost someone, but we discovered, you know, these massive crystals and what happens in the interior of the, of the planet and things like that. You can't board up every single cave in the planet and say, we're never going back because this one poor, courageous scientist lost his life. That is what a hero is. That's what a hero is. So the more we put our, the more we constrain this possibility of emerging heroes, the more we hurt ourselves in the long time because if people are not inspired, transformative changes aren't being made, we're not going to see the next, the next turn. You know, what's the next thing that's going to happen in the future? You know, I want to see that. Now look at this, look at this. This spacesuit is ridiculous, respectfully. This is ridiculous. Like, astronauts do not want to do spacewalks. Why? Because they walk around like this. If something happens, it can't be like, my, my, my hammer is just floating in space. It's going to hit the space station and kill everyone. I can't reach anymore. No, you need to be flexible. We don't have the materials. We don't have, I mean, people can't. We don't have new threads and technologies and stuff like that. Um, things like nuclear power and propulsion are ignored. There are other countries on the planet, other than the United States, which embrace nuclear power and do research in nuclear propulsion and nuclear technologies. We have the most nuclear reactors out of any other country on the planet. We've had the least accidents out of any other country on the planet. Yet the United States is the most anti-nuclear power or consensus out of any country in the world. We're holding back things like nuclear propulsion and space nuclear power and things like that. Russia is the leader in space nuclear power. They have 5,000 times, they have the ability to, to produce 5,000 times more power by nuclear power in space than any other U.S. Um, spacecraft ever. You know, if they were politically more stable, they would be much further ahead if, if we're still talking about that kind of competition, right? Um, but let me turn it turn it back into you know what's the point here so I don't get too political and you start reading and, and, and you're reading into the thing and you go back and back and you go to JFK and you go what an awesome guy he was and then you come forward and you're like what why why don't we have this kind of person but this is the problem like what happened to this kid he, this person is the problem how many kids do you know today who want to be astronauts my kid does not want to be an astronaut. Everyone in my school wanted to be an astronaut. For years, anyone I ever spoke to wanted to be an astronaut. Now they want to be, they want to just have an iPhone. You know, what do you want to be? I want to be a person that has an iPhone. Then what do you want to do? You use it. <laughs> or or I mean, what, what, what is that ambition? You know, some, some interesting stuff about robotics is maybe coming out that I've noticed. Like kids, generally, they want to be robotics. What's the grand vision for the human race? You 
know, renewable energy sources and stuff like that. Like that stuff is going to happen technologically. What's driving it? There's no clear target or objective for space exploration over the next decade. No one cares. Are you going to the moon? Are you going to Mars? Are you going to an asteroid? Who's doing what? Are you even going to? I thought we were going to the moon. Cancel that plan. I thought we were going to Mars now. Cancel that plan too. Every president changes. It's a platform, right? It's a platform. Someone has to be the Mars advocate, the, the moon advocate. So I think it's time to take matters into our own hands. That's what that research and what is not just me, but a massive pool of people came to realize that there is no way out. <laughs> and there should just be one goal, one massive, all-encompassing, completely understandable by everyone and agreeable goal. We need to go and travel to another star. Not because we're sci-fi fanatics, but because of all of these things that didn't get done, because of the lack of the vision. Okay, so I don't, I'm not an interstellar engineer, which we were in the fortunate position to even coin the, the phrase and the degree and to, put the, to get the, the curriculum, right? But I'm not an interstellar engineer because I actually want to come to another star, freak me out, you know, all alone, you know, <laughs> over there and stuff like that. But for what it's going to do for the Earth, to try to pursue that future, to try to pursue that future, it's, it's purposefully so far away that you're going to continue to try to make advances and make everything better and life support systems and better materials and most, more renewable energy sources or, uh, you know, uh, things like a better biosphere things like faster and better propulsion. If someone has an accident on the International Space Station, you're like, let's put a committee together to plan um, how we're going to save these folks. Or you could have an interstellar grade engine being able to go there in 15 seconds, 15 minutes, come on, it's not that fast, but in 15 minutes, <laughs> save these people and bring them back. Or what happens when there's a problem, a big problem. What happens when there's a big problem? Like there's an asteroid on the way. Like this is really morbid, you know? It's all over, guys. An asteroid is on the way, it's just a little bit too big for us to do anything about it. Actually, there's nothing we can do about it right now. Why? Because we do not have a Saturn V rocket. We do not have a rocket that can successfully take something that's big enough as a nuclear warhead out of our solar system, out of our, out of our planet, to engage in time an asteroid to deflect it. Not destroy it, that's no, no. That's not going to happen. But to deflect it. Are we going to call another committee and try to figure out why it didn't happen? No. So this is why, this is why we explore interstellar space for all the things that it could give us and that, it, and that we need to have and that we deserve and that which is within our grasp. And this is why. Because it's really, really hard to do. There's, there's other people interested. It's not just us. You know, there's Kepler, NASA co-rotation. There's, there's exoplanet searches going on all the time. Why are we looking for exoplanets if we never plan on going there? So you found it. That's great. You know, that's like window shopping. Oh. <laughs> Saw this awesome shirt. Just like, yeah? Do you want to buy it? Oh, it's, just look at it. <laughs> I want to walk by it every day. Look at it. <laughs> the, the Europeans, who, who are really sting, stingy, right? <laughs> they don't like invest in anything. They're, they're putting almost, almost 40 billion behind this extremely large telescope. It's 45 meters big. That's Big Ben on over to the side. This is like an in, insane size telescope. What the hell are they trying to look at? They're trying to look at exoplanets. It's, they're trying to find planets around other stars. Why are you trying to find planets around other stars if you're not <coughs> planning on going there? If you're not interested in it, if it's not relevant, it's going to look. So we found that 5.5% of all stars have Earth-sized planets. 
we've discovered a, a small planet around Alpha Centauri called Alpha Centauri BB, which is really hot and too close to the sun, but we found one. If you're looking for Alpha Centauri, which is the closest star system to the, to the sun, to, to our solar system, you're looking at about 60 degrees south from the equator. And funny thing about Anchorage, we're the furthest away on Alpha Centauri. <laughs> Everyone else on the planet. <laughs> so once we find a planet, how do we do it? What's it going to take? So you know they say every time you put an equation on the, on the slide, you use half of your audience. <laughs> so let's pretend that this is in here. What it means is that we need, based on what we can do today, we need 15,000 times improvement on everything that we can do. That's like a better slide. But I had to put some numbers because the signs will pop up there and say, <laughs> 15,000 times improvement. That's on average. That's like shielding, speed, uh, power production, um, how, how good your renewable energy sources are, like everything across the field. It's around 15,000 15, times. And it's awesome that it's always around 15,000 times. It's actually like the spreadsheet is like, you know, 14,000, 16,000. It's like around 15,000. It's interesting. So I, so I thought of something. It's like, have we ever done that before? You know, have we ever done that before? And I skipped the slide, but I didn't like it. This is the better one. <laughs> Trains, right? I was just looking at technologies. Trains between 1930s and the 1970s, the Saturn V to this, the fastest vehicle produced 4,300 4, 4, horses, and the Saturn V produced 160 million horses within 40, 50 years. Why? Because we had a goal, right? There was something driving that. It wasn't, oh, we're never gonna fly, let's just take the train. <laughs> let's just take the train. <laughs> but if you're trying to go to another star, how are you gonna take the train? That's transformative. That drives people, you're like, you're gonna have to fly, you're gonna have to go through the atmosphere. No. And we tend to, this is another important point, we tend to underestimate what we can do over long time scales, okay? So to, to, to just bring a point, like this is an image of what Victorian England looked like at the time where J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, okay? So the elect like these guys are driving by going, whoa. <laughs> Are like grand, <laughs> and and J. J. Thompson is in that warehouse in the back. It's not really, but just imagine it. He's in the warehouse in the back. Going, oh crap! There's a charge differential in this in this copper foil, and he runs out, and they're like chasing me on my bike. This weird person. You know, he just discovered modern electronics. This is the person that gave birth to electronics. Every circuit, every battery every every everything right transformative change completely revolutionized and completely unappreciated at the time what a challenge right that's a challenge if you're a, like a stunt futurist what transformative changes what inklings what what is that root for transformative change what what was just discovered last month that's going to completely change the way our kids live their lives so like a couple of things, right? The Higgs boson is discovered. It plays into string theory. It's a subatomic particle. It gives mass to various generations of quarks. Right, whatever that means. What it, what's the, the Higgs boson gives mass to objects. It gives mass to particles. It's an electron. If it doesn't bind with the Higgs boson, it doesn't have any mass. What if you could remove the Higgs boson? What if you had a Higgs manipulation engine on your car? And you were like, you sit on your car, you turn it on, the Higgs engine comes on, and instead of two tons, your car is one ton. What's your fuel efficiency? What does that mean for transportation? About traveling to another star, for instance. Or FedEx. 
<laughs> right? Because that's, that's, that's how the world works. Like, who's going to benefit from a day-to-day -day basis? I can send my stuff anywhere I want. Uh, quarks, you know, quantum vacuum theory, energy string theory, all these, like, just, that was just one example with, with a Higgs boson, right? But there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Like, what, what will transform it? But what will drive that? What will drive that transformative change? So, uh, you know, we're talking about interstellar flight, and, and I think I'm like way over my time already. Um, by like two, 20 minutes or something. Because um, I haven't actually thought about it so. <laughs> so I'll tell you what the deal is quickly. You can ask me questions. The British Interplanetary Society uh, put together a project called Project Deadness in the 70s, in the late 70s. And they wanted to prove whether or not interstellar flight was even possible. Like, is it just too far away? Can we travel to another galaxy? It's not possible to travel to another galaxy. It's like thousands, millions of light years away. It's, it's too far to conceive of. Uh, based on physics that we understood today. And they found that they could put together a rocket, a really big thing, we would have to use fusion, which is another form of energy that we haven't tamed quite yet, but it could be done based on the physics that we understand. All right? And they put together a study, a report, and that inspired this, this idea of interstellar flight from, from just the science fiction to, you know, there's some scientists researching it. And uh, we figured that it's time for a redesign. That's kind of how it all came together. So what we did was, got together, come on now, my time is up and it's like not working, that's what <laughs> We got together with the old crew and we said, can we carry the baton forward and like do a Project Icarus, because you're a Project Daedalus and mythologically it's the son of Daedalus, <laughs> and do another spacecraft. And they were like, are you sure you want to call it Icarus? So we traveled to us and we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually had a, a study group on defending the name. <laughs> and uh, everyone was saying, you know, there's all these things about uh, Icarus. Uh, he actually, by, by exploring the limits of the technology, he, he figured out its flaws. And if you don't travel close to the sun, you'd never figure out how to change it and things. I don't like that because it's still burning. My, my take was that he, you know, his, his wings failed. He fell into the ocean. Okay, and then he comes up in the ocean, he's like, where's my dad? He asked, you know, left me by myself. And then he's sitting there and he's like, well, it starts a fire and some of the, the sand, you know, melts and turns into, turn, turns into glass. And he goes, oh, this stuff is hard. I'm going to make some wings out of some harder, tougher stuff. And he goes back into the forest and he starts building himself a new pair of wings. Uh, right, like haven't you seen Rambo 2, Rambo 3? He never dies, right? So I was just taking a hint from that. Uh, and uh, and we've done and we've done pretty good ever since. So we started Project Icarus initially. Um, started training people. Um, we have about 200 researchers around the world. This is an old slide just for Project Icarus. Very young team. We attend a lot of conferences. We outperform most university departments in terms of conference and attendance publications. Um, we're very formally organized, although we're, we're a volunteer team because there's, uh, you know, a lot of people contributing. We have like R and D, you know, professionally designed, uh, you know, research and development uh, structure with phase gates every so often to, to approve the designs. Uh, we, we do like a full 360 on te technological maps, so people come into the team, they have some expertise, we like build the team around them and they keep on researching, they keep on researching, they keep on researching. And all of this is done on people's essentially spare time. Because not everyone can work on a space mission. There's only so many out there. And there's more PhDs and more master's students and more people interested in that kind of thing and more people in with access to Wikipedia and so on and so forth that can build those expertise by themselves. So it's not just for the scientists, it's for everyone who wants to. Everyone who wants to has a place at a place. We designed a litter of spacecraft. These kind of things would cost tens of millions of dollars to, to try to organize and design. We've done this with a volunteer team. Fusion engines, um, thermal load studies, 
um, antimatter concept variants. I like spreadsheets upon spreadsheets upon spreadsheets upon spreadsheets upon spreadsheets. Planetary evolution modeling, um, planetary stability models for exoplanets. Like it just doesn't, it just it does not, it does not stop. I'm not joking, it just keeps on going. And we got, and then that was before we got organized. <laughs> you know, now, then we formed the Carissa just that way. And, uh, you know, we kind of truncated a little bit the before 2100. We figured we're going to start some other projects like Project Hyperion, which is human inhabitation vessels because Project Icarus was only for fusion rockets. Spreadsheets, spreadsheets, designs, uh, like a, uh, basically uh, every, each, each one of these is a habitat, and so on and so forth, and architects and stuff like ex analyzing things. Project Forward, which is that's a massive solar sail which is the size that it needs to be if you want to travel to another star. Oops, stability modeling. Uh, sustainable architectures for world ships. You know, this lovely, this lovely young woman, Rachel Armstrong, who's a TED fellow. She like designs these transformative materials that adapt and they absorb toxins and put out oxygen. It's like, what? It's just massive, wonderful, wonderful technology. It's like, how do, you, how do you rebuild, how would you build a city on a starship? It would not be bricks, I'll tell you that. Because if you get hungry, this is what you said to me. If you get hungry, you're gonna to have to wanna to eat you're gonna to have to be able to eat the walls. You're not gonna be like, I've got all this marble here. Nothing can grow on it. It's a waste of space, it's a waste of mass. You know, are you gonna have a garden or are you gonna have is it is it just gonna be growing everywhere and you're gonna be walking by and eating berries while you're walking through a carrot corridor or stuff like that? Just rethink everything. Of course, antimatter and some zero point warp space time metrics and some stuff like that, but all within the realm of physics. Again, formal studies, not just we have a warp drive. And some of our team work with, uh, uh, with the Interstellar movie and the, and the Star Trek uh, movies and so on and so forth. Tiny things like tiny interstellar CubeSats, this is something that I was working on. Massive engines with like new Project Icarus designs. It just doesn't end. It doesn't end. It just doesn't end. Actually, it ends. <laughs> this presentation. We put together a conference last year. Dr. Minovich, who was the inventor of the gravitational assist, came out of hibernation after about 30 years. He had not been to a conference. He came out to come to our conference. It was amazing. Dr. Winterberg, who invented the first fusion rocket, came to our conference. And it just keeps on going, keeps on going. We put the makerspace together locally here, which is right behind here, um, as a sort of effort to do something more locally. Icarus helped the formation of the makerspace specifically. And of course, my first thing was to print the Daedalus and to make some vodka. <laughs> and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of fast forward to the end to open up to, to some other ideas. Like the ideas just don't end, and I'm just going to stop here. Um, I guess just with with the final note is it's about the it's about it's about inspiring people. It's about bringing on the future that you want to see for yourself and for your children. And it's about like feel feel like technological evolution and studies in Iraq right now. And something is holding it back. What's the big plan? What is the big plan? I wake up some someday in the morning. But what's the point? What are we actually trying to do as a, as a race? Is there some point to all of this? And it can only take one or two or three people to, to instill that vision, like we saw. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Do you have a website? Is the question. And the website is IcarusInterstellar.org. Any other questions? Yes.
But we live in a world on the earth which is is getting a, a little scary because we're not sure we're gonna be able to exist here much longer. And it seems to me that you know if we have some answers to those questions, it'd be really a lot easier to believe in doing the kinds of things that you're talking about. And I'm not saying that you should find those answers, but I mean, if we're not here, we can't go to space. Right. So I don't know how to accommodate that. We're, we're in complete agreement, in fact. So the question is, the world is becoming a scary place. There's, uh, you know, we, our own survival is, a, is questionable. You know, we're several hundreds of years. You know, we're polluting the planet. Um, you know, there's strife, there's hunger, and there's overpopulation, and so on and so forth. So how do you accommodate the idea of this grandiose vision of space flight when, when we have so many other problems to solve on, on Earth? And uh, I'll tell you that that, uh, that that is why you need to have a bigger a bigger vision. The, the the technology that we use today was not invented because we wanted to invent the specific technologies. They were spin-offs from a bigger mission. People are, people are not driven to get up and work five hours early. You know, to get to go into work in order to to design a more efficient battery that someone is going to go and mass produce and make some money out of. But you would do it if it's a battery that's going to save the lives of astronauts that are on Mars and you're part of this bigger thing. You do things for your family that you wouldn't do that you wouldn't do for others, right? So when when you have when when, when there's a, a halo, when there's a plan around what your objective is, it's better to, it's easier to focus. And that's, and that's why interstellar flight is, is so important in my perspective, that it breaks through barriers which, which give a focus for what exactly we're trying to achieve. Like, are we just trying, what is, the, or what's the pickup, what has been the pickup over, uh, over the last couple of years with, uh, with renewable energy sources, for instance, right? Like, the government went through massive investments, uh, most of the companies failed, most of the investments were in solar panels and things like that because it was decided at a committee level, you know, somewhere in where the funding comes from, that that was something that would that people would understand. People would understand why the government is invested in solar panels, you know. But every scientist knows that that's not where you start. You start in material science because we don't have the technology to develop the solar panels that are needed to produce the energy outputs that those solar panels can, can produce. It's somewhere else. But if you had a goal of saying, we need to produce at least 50% of the total power on the planet by renewable energy sources, by any means, by any means possible, then you let the researchers do all of this other work that's going to spin off. <laughs> like why, does, why do phones need to be charged? That's not, that's not going to be happening in 10, 15 not. But it's not going to be a consequence of some kid going to do a PhD because he doesn't want to charge his phone. He wants it to automatically charge. Right? Do you see what I mean? There's something else that's going to drive that. And that grand vision, that vision is what will fill us with excitement and wonder again and make us want to succeed in, in this bigger vision. That, that's why. Yes, sir. Your graph showed that NASA has been flat funded for several decades. Do you know if that's adjusted for inflation at all? Um, I don't know. Okay. I just I can't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, do you know if the graph was the graph that I showed about NASA's funding being flat? Was it adjusted for inflation? And my answer was I don't know if it was. I read a, some interesting information not too long ago. It talked about how in our, our current current level of technology, if we were to design systems and equipment to go try to attempt interstellar space travel, that in 100 years, if we then did the same thing again, 
that spacecraft that we developed in 100 years would actually pass the one that we developed initially on the way awesome. to wherever we're going. <laughs> so kind of getting back to the, the project, is there any consensus that they have on like what is the technology they should at least focus on? Yeah. Oh, what's the technology they should focus on? Okay, so the question is, Maybe your thoughts I guess. It, but I was, you know, yeah, what's just looking at that two problem, questions. looking at that problem, it kind of seems like, well, you better decide on the technology that you're going to try to make. Okay, all right. So the question is, um, there was a study that showed that, you know, the projections in 100 years for energy production, etc. cetera, um, I'm not sure what the studies were, that, that if you produce a spacecraft 100 years from now, they would actually pass the initial spacecraft. So is there a, is there a consensus on what, the, what you should focus on first? And that is kind of what my point was with the train. That and, and this whole idea of like putting putting a a, a con like a, a bigger a, a bigger picture behind everything. Certainly, you're going to pass that first spacecraft. Like we're going to pass the Voyager one and the Voyager two and the Pioneer missions. That is always going to be true, right? So there wouldn't be you know the. If there wasn't, if the Wright brothers didn't come around, there would not be a jet engine. You don't just start researching a jet engine. You start studying aeronautics, right, and basic flight and stuff like that. Even some wing, Da Vinci, flapping wing, you know, stuff, which was a great idea. That like the birds do it, can't we? Like, I think the, wings I think wings. actually the study really got to the point of the less you know, faster than light travel, or at least approaching light travel, was actually realized that, that was the case. That your first interstellar craft, whether it was fusion powered or whatever it would be, when you design one um, several hundred years later, it would be that much more efficient. It would probably pass the first one because it would be taking a lot more than 100 years to get to the It would, it, again, so the comment is is that, that I guess it's a sim similar comment that the later spacecraft would pass the, the earlier spacecraft. Um, but you said something in your first question also about technologies, like which technologies would you focus on? So there's kind of a two-sided answer from that. We don't know, and ap appreciating that you don't know which is the best technology is part of why Icarus and Costeller, when, when Project Icarus was, was, when we figured out how we were gonna design it, Project Icarus, the successor to Daedalus, everyone said, I can see that spacecraft study being completed within the next few years, and we have enough people to do it, so we're going to leave that group and study other things. And initially, I was like, do not leave. You know, stay with the team, let's build cohesion and things like that. But what happened was kind of this, this, this challenge of, of looking at all of the other ways that you can do it. Like, can you do it with solar cells? Can you do it with nuclear power? Can you do it with fuel? Can you do it with, how are the people going to survive? Um, can you do it with like weird gravitational slingshots? Can you do it with, can you mine asteroids and turn them into, into interstellar rockets? Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you, can you, can you? All of these ideas. Just let the people that want to do this research explore all these different variations. One of the challenges of, uh, of Project Tintin, which I just flew through, which was that little CubeSat. So there's, there's these things called CubeSats. They're like 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter spacecraft, tiny little spacecraft. Universities build them, they've got a little transponder on them. Now they've been building rock, little thrusters for them, telecommunication systems, they're getting better and better and better. And I've built a, a couple of those while I was still in, uh, in Texas. So I thought, let's build an interstellar CubeSat. I, it was actually a mistake, so I like, was trying to calculate something, instead of 50,000 tons, I put like 50, 50 grams or something on this performance of this spacecraft, and I was like, oh, wow, it's getting this great performance. But it was actually a mistake. And then I thought, well, what if we just tried to do something with really something that has really small mass? So Project Tintin is a challenge to design and to build small spacecraft that will that will pass each other. So who will pass Tin One? Who will pass Tin Two? Who will pass Tin Three? Because it was. It, Okay, so one thing leads to another, right? So the whole idea was that you would build it out of an Altoids tin. That's how we got its name. And, and then it would be one tin, tin one, tin two, tin three, tin four, and then tin ten became tin, part of tin ten. Uh, 
so yeah, it's all about challenging and trying to pass, trying to pass the next hurdle. You probably only have one more question. Sure. Next question. Last question. Uh, go on. How about you? I think you raised your hand first. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, earlier you Yeah, so the question is, um, how do we, referring to the slide on the Van Allen belts, and how do we protect spacecraft inhabitants by harmful radiations, and whether or not there's any technologies in that direction, and progress in that direction. It is, so my answer is that there, there are a lot of creative ways to get around that, like having a, a sheet of, of water surrounding the, the vessel itself. Because water is a very good absorber of, uh, of cosmic rays and neutrons. Um, anything that has a lot of hydrogen, like plastic, is is a very good absorber of neutrons and, and cosmic rays. And there was some research in space plastics that I was following. Like it was about 15 years ago. It was a guy in Germany. But you know what? It's that's the other side of of three people having a vision and carrying it forward. That person kind of got into that late in his age. He, he retired, and you know what? All of his research just went, just went away, and no one's, just, no one's picked that up. Like I think there's a big, idea. There's, there's something really there for, for space plastics. Uh, that for some reason, it's not being pursued. Um, for interstellar flight, it's a really big concern. Basically, specks of dust turn into thermonuclear warhead grade in, impacts on the spacecraft itself. Um, again, some creative ways, which I'm not. Uh, it's not exactly, it, I haven't dug into this personally, but they, they release, uh, when, when the spacecraft has reached a stable cruising speed, you can release a, a, a cloud or a membrane in, ahead of the spacecraft, and its purpose is to atomize particles, and then you use an electromagnetic field around the spacecraft to deflect them away. But the power drain of that is really large. And it's not easy, right? None of this is easy. And, I, and I'm going to take this over. I have some instructions not here. I'm going to take this last question. I mean, I read it. You see the people on my slide. The have different sections that are devoted to like the colleges and whatnot. Because I don't think I saw anything like the devoted to like uh, people's mental state. Because you can only have so many people on the spaceship, and they can be like the greatest people on Earth. But if you're traveling like 50 to 100 years. Uh, it's definitely not, the team is not finished, it's not complete, it keeps on, it keeps on growing when people come. So the question is, how do you keep people sane on the spacecraft, and is someone watching the, is someone researching this actively, like the psychology of, of people living in space and stuff like that? Uh, and we don't have a program right now. There was a team of psychologists and anthropologists who presented something in Starship Congress, and I forget their name, and I forget the name of the project, but that was, they had a questionnaire, and then they, they had a sets of test questionnaire, and they've been pooling people to see how they would react, and uh, challenging people and stuff like that. Um, I, think, I think that there's interesting reasons to be done there. In terms of how, how people interact and certain stuff, there's been some study by a, uh, by a guy called Cameron Smith, who's a member of Vickers Interstellar now, and he calculated the optimum population, that is 10,000 people for a world ship. Now, a world ship is an interstellar spacecraft that has a that has an active population not in it, and, but he looked at it from anthropological, anthropological trends versus survivability for various um, in various tribes and so on and so forth, and stuff like that. So uh, 10,000, because it, that's been a question that's never been answered. What's the minimum population? Will 1,000 people do it? Because the more people you add, the more water you have to add, the more infrastructure to feed them, and so on and so forth. So if you have a population that's just pretty much determining, like, who can that's an interesting question. Yes. Uh, sure thing. So, uh, well, answer that question. 
personally if you want afterwards. So I just want to thank everyone and turn the mic over finally. And uh, join Cake Bar Center Stellar, you know. Have more cake if there's more cake. Um, Daniel wanted to make a really quick announcement. Hey everybody, uh, as you know, this is gonna be the last science pub unless we get more committee members. Um, the original members, or most of the original members are resigning, moving on to other things. Um, without Linda and Wendy and Jed, Excuse me, Jackie and Dale. This one happened for the last couple of years, so I just want to give them a round of applause, real quick. Woo! Um, I'm organizing a meeting in January for anybody that's interested. If you want to come and talk to me after, I'll get your email. Um, and I just want to thank you guys because without you, none of this would have happened. So thanks. continue to exist. Daniel's going to be in charge of it, so if things are happening, if you want to know if anything is happening, like Anchorage Science Club Facebook, and then if there are any announcements, go get them. Um, the Anchorage Science Pub at gmail.com is still in effect for communication as well. So if there is a future Anchorage Science Pub, that's how you can stay in touch with that possibility. Again, thanks a lot, everybody. We've had a really good time doing this, and we hope that you all have, too. And finish the day. <laughs>